Hi everyone, I hope you are well. This is a really brief slideshow to talk about a legal overview of education for multilingual learners in the United States. Basically, I want you to have a sense of what is supposed to happen legally um, in schools and districts across the country in regards to educating diverse learners when they're diverse linguistically. So, first of all, as you know, we have something called a constitution in the United States, and the portion of the constitution that's really applicable and that ends up being legislated um, when we talk about education for multilingual learners is the 14th Amendment. And this says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, as you may know, according to the Constitution, education is a state responsibility, not a federal one. So federal, the federal government has certain powers and certain responsibilities, among them banking, right, um, having a court system, but everything else is left up to the state, so that includes, you know, driver's licenses, marriage licenses, and schools. So most court cases and legal precedents regarding English learners relate to this section of the 14th Amendment, when they talk about states not denying to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That means that the laws around education that any state might pass should equally protect all the members um, who are affected and all the citizens. So there are some important court cases then um, that have used this constitutional amendment to then legislate what's, you know, what's possible and what's important for uh, English learners. So I'll, I'll walk you through them here. Um, the first is Myers versus Nebraska in 1923. And in this court case, um, in the state of Nebraska, um, the legislators, so the people in the state house of uh, Nebraska passed a law um, saying that you could not instruct children in any language other than English before they were in eighth grade. And so, um, you know, someone sued to challenge that law. Specifically, Nebraska was trying to prohibit the teaching of German. If you think about what was happening in the 1920s, it was between two world wars, right? Number one and number two. And I want you to think about who the United States had been fighting in World War I and might fight again in World War II. Starts with a G, right? Germany, right? And so specifically, the legislators in Nebraska were feeling like they didn't want the German Americans to speak German and teach their children German because they felt like it was a threat to the United States. So the court says in Myers versus Nebraska, you can't do that. You can't say that people can't teach children a certain language. Um, and so um, you can't, it, the law was thrown out, right? A similar law um, was under consideration in this Farrington versus Tokushige, which is a case in Hawaii having to do with the teaching of Japanese. Um, also, a language spoken by a country that was at that time not an ally of the United States. Um, and this law tried to, or in this case, um, Farrington, the school district, tried to prohibit um, the private teaching of Japanese in Saturday schools. Um, and the court said, nope. Um, if the Japanese community wants to teach their children Japanese, they can do that, right? Again, both of these cases ha don't have to do with instruction in public schools, but have to do with private communities teaching um, their children. All right, then if we skip a couple you know, decades later and also a world war later, right? And we get to 1947, 1954. Um, we have Mendez versus Westminster School District. So as you may know, in the 40s and 50s in the United States, many schools were separated and segregated. Um, this includes schools in California, um, which at the time in the 1940s separated uh, Hispanic students from white students and white students from Asian students. Um, and so Sylvia Mendez and her family moved to uh, part of the Westminster School District and Mr. Mendez went to enroll his daughter and they said no we won't enroll her because she's not Anglo. Um, and so he sued um, and 
in this case, um, the California court found that um, segregation in California schools was illegal, um, and so outlawed the separation of students by race um, in different schools. And so as you can see, that was a precursor to Brown versus Board of Education, which found the same thing nationally almost 10 years later. Um, and just as an aside, the, um, when the, one of the members of the California Supreme Court later moved to the federal Supreme Court. Um, Sylvia Mendez is still around and gives awesome speeches, and there are some lovely books about her if you'd like to investigate that. Uh, all right, um, so then we're going to skip another couple of decades. So we have desegregated schools for the most part, although certainly students are certain um, in neighborhoods and go to schools in their neighborhoods, which might be separated in some ways um, by race or ethnicity. And so um, in 1974, um, you have a case brought against um, the school district in San Francisco by Kenny Law and his family and other families of Chinese American students saying that their students weren't learning uh, because they were being taught all in English and the students didn't know English, right? So if you, thinking back to what might have been happening between 1954 and 1974, you have the Civil Rights Movement. And along with the Civil Rights Movement, you have the opening of immigration to people from more places than before. So during, before the Civil Rights Movement, immigration was restricted to mostly white Europeans with a few exceptions. Um, and after the Civil Rights Acts, part of that was um, the deracialization, if you will, or kind of taking the racist undertones out of immigration law and allowing immigration from wider places, right? And increased immigration from East Asia, which had always existed, but had been really regulated um, in other places. So you have a larger, um, newer wave of Chinese Americans um, in San Francisco, and these students are in schools, and they are not understanding the instruction, right? And so this case gets litigated and essentially finds that um, the school has to adapt and do something that there quote quote there is no equality of treatment merely by providing students with the same facilities textbooks teachers and curriculum for students who do not understand English or are effectively foreclosed from any meaningful education so this is the big foundational case um, in English language learner education right it says that schools um, must make accommodations um, so that students who don't speak English can also learn all right, so following this, we have a few other cases that get decided. In Castaneda versus Picard, um, the decision about what exactly schools should be doing is litigated, and I'll talk a bit about that on the next slide. Um, in Plyer versus Doe, the issue of who should be in school is litigated. I'll talk about that as well. And U.S. versus Texas and Cerna versus Portales, and a few cases after this have to do with what should happen in classrooms and districts around um, ESL education and bilingual education. And what's interesting in some of these in Texas, right, is um, some of the courts have found that, or it suggested that really by, especially in certain areas in Texas, by not teaching Anglo students Spanish or Spanish students English, that the school is not kind of giving students what they need to function in their society. Um, so it's advocating for bilingualism in those contexts. All right. So after Law versus Nichols, um, pretty much right after it, the Educa Equal Educational Opportunities Act of 1974 was passed. And just so you get a sense of what the current law is, right, that school districts have to follow, it's this EEOA, right, and all the court cases have been interpreting this, right? So it says, no state shall deny educational opportunities to an individual on account of his or her race, color, sex, or national origin by... There's a lot of different ABC sections, A, B, C, D, okay? And then for section F is the failure of an educational agency to take appropriate action to overcome language barriers that impede equal participation by its students in its instructional programs, right? So if the, if the state is not taking appropriate action to overcome the language barriers, then it is denying students educational opportunities. All right. So there are some important implications of court case of these court cases for our schools today. Um, first is basically from Law versus Nichols that the school district's got to do something. Some type of services must be provided. Um, ha giving students the same English-only materials as English-speaking students does not indicate equal instruction. You cannot do nothing, right? Um, 
Plyer versus Doe from the 80s um, found that schools must admit all students regardless of immigration status. So in this case, the Texas legislature passed um, a law saying we won't educate, educate students who are not documented. Um, that was litigated and the court found that it was in everybody's best interest for everybody to be in school. You know, if you had students who weren't documented not going to school, then they weren't going to be learning, they weren't going to be growing up um, able to participate in any kind of society. You know, you were basically kind of creating some kind of criminal underclass, which is not in anybody's best interest. So Plyer versus Doe means you got to admit all students. It's not the school's um, job to ask for immigration status. And then Castaneda versus Picard, which you saw on the other page, establishes criteria for ESL bilingual programs. So the program that's used by the district should be based on sound educational theory. Obviously, there's some debate about what this means, you know, or different people might have different ideas about the best educational theory, but it should be well substantiated by a variety of experts. It should be implemented effectively with adequate resources and personnel, so you can't say we're doing bilingual education and then never hire a bilingual teacher, right? That's not implemented effectively with adequate resources or personnel. So you've got to do something that's supposed to work, and you've got to actually do it. And then you need to, third, you need to evaluate it. So after a trial period, you have to evaluate it and it has to work. So it should be a good program, you have to actually implement it, and then you have to check and see if it's working. Right, this is Castaneda versus Picard. And then finally, I just wanted to close um, with a note on theory versus practice, which is that this is how things are supposed to work. It happens time and time again that school districts may not be implementing what they're supposed to or there's a shortage of resources and so every once in a while you will see there will be court cases um, arguing that school districts are not meeting their requirements. So for example recently in Massachusetts, Massachusetts was found to be in violation of the EEOA um, and has different stipulations required because of that. So I just wanted to give you a sense that this is how things are supposed to work and they should um, and the process in the United States for when things are not working as they should is to take it to court right after certain discussions and litigations. Um, so this happens to this day.